for a couple of years, I was just kind of, the idea was kind of bouncing around in my head of, of, of uh, would it be possible to kind of initiate this journey of, of a big epic Viking movie with an old Icelandic saga at the core. I didn't know which one, there's so many of them, and I didn't really have a starting point. I didn't know where to, how, how to kind of attack it, but I n kind of knew that it, I wanted the combination of the old sagas are often about a family feud, it's about revenge, they're quite contained. And, and I thought it'd be incredible if you can combine that, but to do that on a, a on an epic scale, so you'd both have big battle scenes, but also at the core of it uh, is this uh, quite intimate story. I immediately I n knew that it should be a revenge story, partially because that's just most uh, of these Viking stories are revenge stories. But you know, a good revenge movie works, and I felt that if I could find a really simple, mythic, clear tale that this audience could relate to and understand, then I could indulge in uh, the material world and the inner and religious and mythological world more than if the story was complex. So really quickly, I discovered uh, the, the story of Amleth that was written by the Danish historian Saxo Grammaticus. And Amleth was the source material for Shakespeare's Hamlet. Uh, also known as the Lion King. And so when I had this story, uncle kills dad, s steals mom, son goes on revenge. Everybody knows this, you know, this just works. So that was really exciting. It's character driven, that was important. You want it to be visually overwhelming and a lot and spectacular, but you need to care about these characters and follow them and, uh, and feel for them and, and uh, and have these intimate moments between them. It was a great movie to shoot because you got, in a way, the best of both worlds. You got these incredible set pieces, big, big fight scenes, but you also got days where, you know, you're in, in a room with Nicole Kidman and just, it's a dead quiet scene, two characters talking to each other for, uh, for, for four, five, six pages. And it's, uh, it's, a, it's a real treat. We can, we can have both in the same movie. All the best directors I've ever worked with lead by example, meaning that they're so immersed in the world that it's contagious. You know, Robert gave me a ton of books and literature and videos to watch about Vikings and played Viking music. And I have a small part in this movie, but his passion for every detail makes you realize that somebody cares. Somebody cares whether it's done right or done wrong. And a lot of times you get a sense that people don't care, people aren't gonna notice. You know, that's the thing about Kazan, they used to say about a lot, Kazan, he just noticed everything. He noticed everything, and that's why the work is so good, is it's, each detail in and of itself doesn't matter, but a thousand details has an, a gravitational pull towards excellence, and, um, and Robert has that. Robert Eggers is uh, someone that, when I saw his uh, first feature, The Witch, I reached out to him because I wanted to work with the guy. And then I was lucky enough to work with him on his next feature, The Lighthouse, and it was a very good experience. I really enjoyed working with him. Because of his detail, uh, because he uh, makes a personal cinema, he does a cinema that uses cinema language. Very little coverage, very designed shots, working with uh, Jaron Blaschke as DP, they work very closely. It's a combination of um, being very well designed and very well realized, but also he's an actor. <laughs> he was an actor. He speaks an actor's language. So I love working with him because he works with a great kind of back and forth in the scenes and gives me lots of details and lots of challenges. And I feel always very engaged with, when I'm with him. Most importantly, he's a, a guy of the cinema but he's also a student of history, and he loves history so deeply, you feel it, that it's infectious. You get drawn into those worlds with him, and as an actor, you just want to help him realize them as, as you can in your role. My biggest misconception about Vikings was just that they were, you know, big, stupid, raping, pillaging, you know, and, and, and look, the Vikings, did a lot of terrible stuff like there, you know, and, and I don't shy away from that uh, in the film. But what got me fascinated was the rich mythology and and poetry. As I learned more, even, you know, their, their wood carvings and visual artistic expression was also 
very inspiring. But I think when you're dealing with these pagans, who are, they're the pagan in the period in our film, who every part of life is an expression of, of belief and belief is an expression of every part of life. There is so much beauty in the way that they saw the world. I try to present this this mindset, this, 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 the Viking mind without judgment. You know, this is, this is their beliefs. It's not my beliefs, it's not your beliefs. This is their beliefs. But even then in not trying to romanticize their beliefs, I think with, with the revenge motif, as an audience member, part of you just wants him to get revenge because that's the way these kinds of stories work. But you do ask questions, hopefully, if I've done my job, who's right? And who's wrong? And that's one of the th cool things about the saga is, is that they also, as far as the 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 protagonists and the antagonists, there is often gray area there. You know, they're they are full characters, and so I hope that you, you know, even in telling this story in about a culture who says you must revenge and you're going to be shamed and criticized, and everyone's going to hate you and you're a failure if you don't revenge, uh, that we can still wonder if that's the right thing to do. In this version of the story that Robert, Robert has written, it plays a very big part because they are very superstitious. They do believe in all this, the, the whole, this whole magical world of all these weird spirits and, and they do believe that they can actually, that they can just make a sacrifice of someone and, and that'll just sort it. When I first got, well, the first draft of The Northman, I was so happy I cried. It was the, it had that, like the old Icelandic sagas, that dry, laconic tone, these incredible, succinct lines, just to the point. You don't really say more than necessary, and a lot of it is just set through looks. It had all that, almost like a play between these characters, but on a massive scale. The authenticity of the project is something that's very uh, key to the way that Rob works, and it makes everything so much easier because, you know, you put on your costume and then you walk into the world and you're there. Like, there's no imagination necessarily needed in order to get yourself to this place. Rob's sense of clarity about the movie he sees in his head is very helpful and kind of, as I'm a student in the Willem Dafoe School of Acting, it becomes very easy once there's a, a path where you know the stage is. This is where the stage is. This is where the light is. This is where your performance goes. Everything becomes very simple. It's a big, muscular film, much, much bigger than The Lighthouse. He still is approaching it with the same kind of detail and the same kind of care. And while I may sound Pollyanna, uh, at this point, the producers are fantastic because they're supporting him in that approach. And a lot of that has to do with not just detail in the set, but these beautiful shots that are very designed, that play as one and have inside each shot has a rhythm and a story and a dynamic that's, that's beautiful on its own. He doesn't cover things. He doesn't, he doesn't protect himself and make the film in the editing room, although he's got a great editor in Louise Ford, who he's worked with two times before. He doesn't have all uh, standard coverage. So there's a kind of concentration and a kind of engagement that's really all in when you are a performer in these shots. There's a, there's a precision and there's a demand on you to be really concentrated and you're never outside of it because you have to concentrate so hard, be involved so hard, and be absorbed into the world to make the shot work. He wanted shots that were uh, dense, you know, um, as far as, you know, not, not uh, kind of longer takes with a lot going on in the background, just rich frames that just kind of go on. It was just like reducing things to the essentials. Uh, you really have to think about it for a long time. Like, how do you reduce, how do you put, how do you pack all this information with all these characters and these abstract ideas of magic and following a fox the same time he sees his mother for the first time? Like, how do you sort of rearrange all these, all this information into just nice, clean streams of information in, in less shots you could you know, you could sort of just kind of pick off stuff, but that's just not very, I don't know, like a, something layered and complex, you know, whether it's food, wine, whatever, is just more satisfying than just sort of like little simple nibbles. And I just wanted to try that. How many things can you fit into one visual idea, you know, and still have it work? CeCe Smith 
our stunt coordinator was uh, phenomenal and had to work really, really hard. It's very difficult to shoot a movie like this for anyone, let alone the stunt coordinator, because again, his hands were tied. It was one camera on film, uh, no cuts, so everything had to be perfect. On this film, there's only one camera, so to get your cuts in there is very, very difficult. And so that was a process for me to learn as well. There's no cheats, you know, I'm using my actor. Jaron, uh, my DP and I, we would go and watch CC rehearse these scenes with his guides. And then Jaron would be with an iPhone trying to figure out uh, the camera placement. And so we were having to work together in, in, in working in this fashion where there's all these long takes. Like, how can we work? You know, again, it's it, the whole thing becomes a, a machine. It becomes a big dance when you're working in this way. So, so we were constantly, constantly improving to to make it more holistic. Is everybody that need to, I mean, be on their toes and perform? It just becomes important in a different way. I mean, you, it's as if you sort of come together in telling the story in a different way. I really like that. Even if sometimes you're like, I can reach. Please not make it so difficult for ourselves. Just do a little bit of coverage here, a little bit of coverage here, and just edit together and just go home. But at the end of the day, I would say that it's been, the stakes are just higher, and, it, and, and, and you can feel that. The research behind, behind the film is, uh, we did a, just a ton. I don't know if I can even do it justice in how much research we did, but you know, we wanted to get the world of Amlis, 10th century Viking world, we wanted to get that world correct. We had a, an authentic sword, which they brought in, and Robert was showing everybody, this is what, the real one, it's been dug up. It was a bit of a mess, but you know, it would be over all them years, but <laughs> and it, was, it was nice to be involved with it, and the props, I mean, they're amazing. If we, something could turn up, everybody would look at it, that would go if it wasn't right, it wouldn't even go in the background, it's, that's not on the set. So I think it was a big, big part of it. Even the boats, I mean, they built those boats. They're amazing. It was incredible actually to be on set. You know, there is so much detail and so much energy spent on trying to, um, you know, make the costume sets, props, everything as authentic as possible. And then when you add to that the horses, the stunts, the camera work, it was really, you know, like being shot back in time. Craig, the production designer, Linda Muir, the costume designer, they know how I work. And everyone else didn't. And th this idea that don't, don't, no, don't look at pictures of Viking swords and then design a cool one with a dragon on it. Just make me that sword. Or make me like that sword hilt with that blade. Maybe that pommel. But that's it. It's like just do the research, and it was really it was actually hard for people to wrap their minds around at first. Every, you know, everyone got there and everyone enjoyed it. But Tommy was the first new person who was like, "You want me to make museum replicas? Got it." People are nerdy and geeky about this. They they want their details right. But just two days before we started shooting, I was brought out to set. I arrived there and and knowing what I was wearing and knowing that, how, um, that, that everything out there, it, it's, it, it could be turned into a museum now. That, is that accurate? I mean, if they want to leave those houses out there, it could be sort of a museum of what a, a, a village looked like back then. That's how accurate it's done. It's so easy to do a good job as an actor in this movie because the world is so real. When the world is not real, the actor has to expend a tremendous amount of energy to distract you from all these fake costumes and fake sets and bad photography. And when the photography is excellent and the costumes are excellent and the production design is excellent, well, then the actor disappears. It's all happening by itself. It's really wonderful. It's been so wonderful to work with Robert again. I feel so lucky that my first experience in filmmaking was with him because I didn't actually realize how much of the way that I comport myself on set, the way that I approach my work, how much of that actually comes from him. It's only in coming back onto set and seeing the way he works that I'm like, oh, I get it from you. That's where I get these little things from. Yeah, he's just, he's just the best. I don't think I've been very lucky with the people that I work with, but because Rob and I have such an understanding of each other, we just go to really interesting places very quickly. It's, it's one of my favorite experiences. 
Enya, uh, aside from being, uh, you know, a perfectionist in her work and an incredible actress who's able to express really uh, deep subtext with a simple line. She's also super professional. A lot of times was almost a background character in some of these scenes. A lot of actresses might have asked to use a double, but she was there with her shoes off in the mud in the freezing cold and being a, a leader for everyone to respect and say like, this, this, is, this is how you conduct yourself uh, on a set. Anya's uh, incredible to work with. We don't have that many scenes, at least in the first half of the movie. So it was really important to, to kind of pack a punch in those scenes and to really feel that connection. I, I think it helps that we had a lot of fun together and we did enjoy spending time together, or, or I hope, at least I did, I hope Anya felt the same way. We, we talked a lot about it because there are so few scenes in the beginning and the setup of this relationship. It, it was very important that for the audience to feel oh, this is a strong connection and he can't do this without her. The Northman is a story that everyone can relate to. It is the, the story of a, a son seeking his father's vengeance. It's a story about family dynamics. It's a story about love. And it's an exciting adventure movie. We think we know Viking stories and we think we, we know these kinds of epics like this. And to a certain degree, we do. I'm making... A, a movie for a broad audience in a way that I never have before. It really is intended to be something that like everyone can enjoy and like and eat their popcorn to. You know, there are set piece action sequences, which which is something that I've never done before. But because it's character driven, hopefully you walk away thinking about the movie and you know, as much as you also were literally entertained. The film language that's being used and the precision and the passion that um, Robert and Jaron and the whole team has this way of shooting a lot of big action sequences without a lot of cutting away. You really experience it. it, it you aren't numbed just by noise and by fast cutting. These shots are designed. There's a beauty to it. I think it's special for that. From what I've seen and what we've been shooting, it really taps into what you can only do in a movie. It's a Viking Hamlet. I mean, who do, for me, that's I'm, I'm already sold. I want to see a Viking Hamlet. I mean, give me a break. It's got the most amazing language and some of the most amazing imagery uh, that I've seen on any production I've ever worked on. It's brutal, it's fantastical, epic, and it's really callously beautiful. Like, it's just, it's so, beautiful but raw and oh yeah it's um it's a very visceral experience i think i just really like to tell great stories and i don't actually really care if they're set in the viking age or now or in 1945 or whenever so i hope that this is something that will move people and that will reach out to them and they can see or find themselves in, or that will have something, a bit of something to think about, or having been touched or moved, or I hope it does all that. You want them to have an experience, to enter into this world, to consider another way of being, to consider another time, to consider themselves in that other time. Of course, there's a story, a very complicated story on one level and a very simple story on another level. But I think what's going to be really exciting is to see a world that they haven't seen before. And I suppose everybody says that when they make a film because they're very, um, you know, precious about their little world. But I think uh, the amount of research and the amount of support in uh, what Robert's doing is really uh, impressive. I must say that um, even I, in the age of COVID have been able to watch things at home in a way that I, I've found more comfortable doing, you know? And, and, and as a filmmaker, like, I ha I, like I've like i tried so hard my professional life and, 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 and before that just as a movie lover to always see stuff in the theaters. And, and I know it's hard, it's hard. But this, this is a movie you have to see in theaters. You know, Dune was something that I was not gonna see like on HBO Max. And you know, this is a big, it's literally an epic. It's literally an epic. You know, we have these like 
I, these Icelandic landscapes and these battle sequences, and you need to be transform, transported. You need to be transported to the 10th century. You need to be transported to, to the Viking Age. And it's it like not only for the visuals, but the sound, you know, to really be in a, a movie theater and experience the waves crashing against the boat and the storm at sea. And, you know, you, you know without that, you cannot fully experience what this movie is. Yeah!